and the screen says we are live. A very warm and good morning to everybody who is attending the webinar this morning. We have a full house of presenters and I'd just quickly like to welcome especially our guest speaker Rick Marcellus from um, the Netherlands for joining us at seven o'clock his time in the morning. Thank you Rick for doing that and welcome. Rob Kerridge Walker, the chairperson of our special interest group in software testing uh, or quality assurance, if we prefer. Rob, good to see you again and welcome. And mm -hmm. Johan Stein, our chair of the special interest group in artificial intelligence, also our chapter chair for the Houting province. Welcome to you, Johan. Always good to have you with us. And then a very warm welcome, especially to all our delegates who I see are logging in fast and furiously. Good to have you all joining us this morning. This is our first webinar for 2022. Make sure I get the year right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so it's really good to have you with us. I see a lot of familiar names on the chat and we'll greet you a little separately later. But it's it's my pleasure uh, really just to do the, the opening and to welcome everyone. I'm going to hand over to Johan, who's going to drive the rest of the webinar together with the other two gents. But um, from IITPSA, we wish all of our members, all of our guest visitors, everything of the very, very best for 2022. We hope it is a productive, challenging and fun year and certainly better than the last couple that we kind of wish to forget, you know, 2019, 2023 kind of thing. No, wait a second, 2022. Mm -hmm. So good morning to you all, Johan, it's uh, your show. So thank you to the three guys again and over to you. Thank you, Tony, uh, for this opportunity. Again, to you and the team at the IIT PSA who's helping us with the all the stuff in the background to get these event going, events going. Um, and like you said, I see a number of, of familiar names already, uh, people that uh, I was their customer or they were mine in this world of, of QA. Uh, so that is very interesting. I wanted to just quickly check, Tony. I tried to, to add something to the chat, but for some reason I can't. So I don't know if it is a, let me just see, it could be my screen. Hang on a second. There we go. T oh, type your comments. I have to scroll all the way down. There we go. Okay. Technical problems aside. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to this very interesting topic. It is a co-SIG or special interest group event uh, between the, the AI and robotics and the software engineering or quality engineering one. Um, please remember to add comments and questions in the chat. We'll try and get toward uh, the end to as many questions as possible, but we we'll, might also grab some comments uh, as we go and as it's relevant to where we are in the conversation. Before we, we introduce uh, Rick, I would like to welcome Rob. And Rob, if you can just maybe introduce yourself and also talk about your special interest group, uh, please. Greetings, everybody. I uh, haven't seen you. Uh, I saw you at the end of last year, but uh, getting used to these webinars being a one-way view to talk to a screen. Um, I've done a little bit of training last year and it took a while for people to warm up and show their faces. It actually almost makes it normal. But but in lieu of that, greetings and uh, uh, to Tony's point, a very great 2022 to you all. Um, I hope it's a great year and I hope it's a great year for quality. Maybe this year we maybe learn a few things from the past. Um, also, thank you to uh, Johan for prompting the session. We had a good discussion after a very long time, had a cup of coffee and a wimpy down the road, which is a great privilege these days to meet someone face to face. A <laughs> um, little bit, bit about SIG. Um, most of you, I would think, probably know uh, the special interest group in software testing has been going for many years, um, some years more active than others. Um, Last year, we had a, a good few uh, sessions, and we'd like to ramp that up this year. We've kind of put placeholders together for this year. Hopefully, we'll have one every month. Um, I will regenerate our form. Any of you guys out there with a passion to talk about something in quality, please, uh, I'll get hold of the link. I'll send it out to you guys. Please just drop, fill in a very brief form. And then we'll get hold of you and we'll schedule some talks. We also want to change things up a bit. We might try a few like panel that's similar to this, panel discussions for normal presentations, things like that. Uh, but but to keep that, you know, to keep that passion going and learning things in this changed paradigm of ours is is always a great thing. Um, 
A little bit about myself. I've been in testing for far too long, probably <laughs> well over 20, 25 years plus. Um, been working for software uh, consulting houses, done work for the financial in the, the likes of Nedbank, Standard Bank, um, apps a little bit know me. F and B have avoided me for some reason, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, been around a long time. Done a lot of test management. More recent, more recent years have grabbed hold of lean, um, agile, and embraced that. And it's become a real way that I think, and a way of, I feel the only way to go forward is quality, is continuous improvement. As long as we challenge ourselves our processes and how we do things. I think it's really important. And and that's kind of and my my mantra in life is to try share share knowledge and to try give people opportunities um, to to go forward. And and lastly I'd just like to thank Rick. I'm sorry I missed meeting you earlier this this month uh, in a in a meeting. But thank you very much. Um, I've always been a great fan of Sagetti and in early years, TPI, I was quite well involved with that in South Africa, and um, very pleased to have you on board and to to have your time today. And thanks, Tony and Johan and everyone for joining. And that's me. Good, Rob. Thank you so much. We've known mm. each other for a long time. Many scars on our backs caused by customers not understanding quality. <laughs> um, <laughs> and just be, again, before I get to Rick, um, for, for all our delegates, when um, Rob and I started speaking about what, what is the intersection between this new era of smart technologies, you know, IoT, AI, machine learning, robotic process automation. We, we read a lot more about the metaverse these days and with quality software. And I think the importance of software working as it should is increasing exponentially because now it's no longer that my banking app might be down or there's some problem there. We talking more about more about this convergence of our biology with technology. I mean, this year, Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk will for the first time do an implant into somebody's brain, which can have great health benefits if we think of brain or spinal cord inju injuries or dementia. But think of the ethics and the philosophy behind that as well. It's one thing if you could read my thoughts. But what if you can influence my thoughts? So um, think of, um, of pacemakers, think of insulin pumps. A lot of these are IoT devices these days. And the so suddenly it's no longer the inconvenience of I can't access my banking app for a few hours. Now it's a life and death situation. So quality software in this age of artificial intelligence is imperative. I'm going to put a link in the chat quickly, and, and this is the last bit of marketing from my side. Um, I produced a book in... Uh, Earlier this month, so over the last six months, I've written a lot for Business Day and for Brainstorm and IT Web and others. So it's a free download if you go to that site. It's essentially just a, a combination of, of all my articles um, on AI and particularly on the societal impact of this technology. And that's now enough marketing. Rick Marcellus from the Netherlands. It's lovely to see you. Like Rob, I have been a, a fan for many years, read your books, and we're going to speak about that today. So it is a great honor for us at the IIT PSA to have you. Rick is a principal quality consultant, a coach, an international speaker. He's at the Sojeti Labs, as Rob has said. And he's the author of or co-author of two books. The one is called Quality for DevOps Teams. And then the one that I like the most, <laughs> uh, Rick, is Testing in the Digital Age, AI Makes a Difference. And then also uh, he works with Tom van der Ven uh, producing podcasts. I was uh, honored to twice be a guest on their podcast. That's a lot of fun. So um, I'm going to, when you start speaking, Rick, I'm going to put the links of the two books in the chat. People go and have a look. It's really worth looking at uh, Rick's uh, books. So Rick, welcome. Did I miss anything on the introduction? <laughs> I think you're on, on mute, uh, Rick. Yeah. Ah, this helps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Johan. And uh, good morning, Rob and uh, Tony as well. And good morning, uh, everybody. And uh, well, did you miss anything in the uh, intro? Well, 
I, I have been working on a lot of books as well, but uh, the ones you mentioned are the most recent uh, books. And uh, I am very intrigued by what uh, AI and all this modern technology uh, can bring us, but also the dilemmas it brings us and, and the quality challenges. So uh, I'm very happy that we are together here uh, to discuss this. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Rick, so much. I um, let's maybe kick off with the the two books. Um, take us through, you know, what made you and your team write these books. How has it been um, received? And maybe so we can start with quality for DevOps teams. Maybe just summarize what that book is about. Well, the trigger for quality for DevOps teams is that a lot of people mentioned to us that uh, our ideas about testing were outdated which we thought were not but if people have that general idea then it's better to prove they are not so we uh, uh, gathered old and new ideas about quality uh, engineering and testing together and one of the reasons why we now call it quality engineering is that as most people know but not always act upon is that it's better to build quality in from the start than to test quality in at the end. So for us, quality engineering is much broader than just testing. It is trying to use all kinds of quality measures to ensure that quality is there all the time. And then often people talk about high quality or the highest quality, but we talk about the right quality. Because sometimes mediocre quality at the right moment is much better than very high quality way too late. And of course, the right quality also relates to the risks. Eh? So in the intro, Johan, you were talking about uh, health uh, influencing software. Well, of course, there your quality standards will be somewhat higher than in an average gaming app, uh, so to say. So that was what triggered us to create the book. And the book is uh, uh, divided in eight parts. And uh, it starts with why do we do uh, IT in the first place? Well, that is to generate business value. So business value is the starting point huh? because IT may be our hobby, but we don't get paid to do our hobby. We get paid to, do, uh, to create business value. And then... We uh, have our ideas about what are the activities needed to build in quality and uh, measure quality. And uh, in the book also, there's a lot about testing, of course. Uh, we have a whole part about test design with uh, test design techniques and how you group test design techniques. Um, and also uh, something about uh, the... Uh, quality characteristics, which probably is something that we'll touch upon during our talk. So I won't go in depth uh, at the moment. So that's uh, an overview of uh, the book. Uh, Super. I'm going to ask you about the, the other book before I hand over to Rob. So Testing in a Digital Age, I love that book because you, you talk about testing AI, but also using AI to test. So if you can maybe, what, what's the difference there? And also just, uh, again, a summary of, of that book, uh, Rick, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, and when we started writing that book, and that's about five years ago now, I think we released the book three and a half years ago, but we started thinking about it some five years ago. And then uh, AI was just starting to become, well, uh, getting common interest, eh? of course, Artificial intelligence has been around for a very long time, but it must have been about five years ago that the general public came to know about it. And I immediately was intrigued by what does this mean for testing? And, and I met uh, Tom, as you mentioned, Tom van der Ven, and we started discussing this. And very soon we noticed that sometimes we were talking about other things. Because, like you say, sometimes it is about testing of AI. Does the AI work properly? And sometimes it is testing with AI. So can we use AI to improve our testing? And uh, these are actually two totally different things. 
And then the ultimate question is, and that we often make some fun about, is uh, testing AI with AI. And then it becomes very fuzzy because then you have a system that you don't really understand. Eh? Because if you have really good uh, deep learning algorithms, we hardly understand what they do. And then you use another algorithm that you hardly understand to test it. And do you then still have confidence? Because the basic thing of testing is generating confidence. So, well, and also in the book, uh, we uh, discussed if you want to test AI, what do you need to look for? And, and there are various kinds of AI. And well, again, we looked into uh, quality characteristics and that's something we will uh, definitely talk about later. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Courage Walker. Also on mute. That's that's the thing we've said more than I love you to your partner this last year is you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Johan. And Rick, you even started to answer a few of the questions I had already. So um, it's I have to be honest that uh, with all the things going on in life, uh, AI is something that I've put off a little bit based on certain, you know, certain other priorities, but it's always intriguing. So, uh, and you've kind of answered where you got, got hooked into AI um, when, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but it's always these things that change us in our technology where we go from, from one new thing to the next, and then it becomes the norm, you know, and, uh, I, I, my first question is going to be, when do you see, if it's possible to look into that crystal ball, crystal ball, when do you see AI becoming the norm, the everyday thing that we just used to, like we pick up our, our watch and put it on our sleeve kind of thing? Well, frankly, it already is. It, it, okay. Take take your uh, uh, smartphone uh, out of your pocket, and you're holding an AI device. Uh, the, 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 the one simple thing that I often do, uh, I'll see if I can quickly uh, uh, do it again. I have here, I have my smartphone, and then you have this little box with some faces. And if you click it, oh, I'm now trying to do that. The, you get all the faces. I'll select my own face. Oh, yeah, and then it gives me all the pictures where my face is in the picture. Well, yeah, this yeah. uses AI technology, and most people simply think, "Oh, it's a smart, uh, it's it's a smart uh, tool," but actually, it is AI, so it's already in our daily life. Um, but the problem is, um, more and more uh, IT people are starting to use AI. And not all of them know exactly what they're doing. And that's when it becomes scary. This is true. <laughs> is that societal is impact uh, of what can this tech do to us and our children? Um, I don't know, Rob, I've, I've got a few things on my mind. Do you want to say anything you want to add or ask before uh, we get going? Pop in there. Okay. I've got a couple of other questions, but we'll just okay. let it flow. Super. That's fine. It's interesting. It's it's in mm. testing that I discovered AI, uh, gentlemen and, and delegates. I was working for a bank about five years ago, and one of the big global vendors said, we want to do a proof of concept and show you how our platform using machine learning and pattern recognition can benefit you. And, and I remember we had this huge program, and it's going to sound ridiculous, but we had 100,000 test cases, okay, in this huge multi-year program. And through this software, we realized, obviously, the huge amount of duplicate test cases, the, if you would, almost redundant test cases. And, and what the end, at the end of that proof of concept, we brought the amount of test cases down to just 10,000. So from 100,000 to 10,000. But we increased our test coverage with 64%. And that's when I went, man, what if, because I didn't have a clue what AI was. And that's when I decided to read every book I could, speak to everyone I could. Um, and, and I still today think it's a greatly misunderstood kind of technology. 
people, I would often when I see clients and they start going on about AI and especially RPA and the like, I would just say, just explain to me what you see AI as, because they still think robotic process automation and AI, even though those worlds are converging, they think it's the same thing. So to, to just maybe to your last point there, Rick, that software engineers, our clients, people are starting to use this technology more and more, but it can become very dangerous. So before I go back to Rob, any comments or, or uh, points you want to make on that? Yeah, well, the, um, there, there are so many uh, uh, things going through my head now. Well, um, well, one thing of software going wrong here in the Netherlands was uh, a reason why Actually, our government, uh, uh, how do you say that, F fell over? Is that English? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, last year. And that was because the tax office had started using smart algorithms to, uh, to select which people were uh, frauds and which were not. And then... In the end, it turned out that the algorithms were not perfect. So a lot of people were uh, deemed to be uh, uh, sending fraud, uh, fraudulous uh, things to the tax office, which they were not. But, the, but then if the tax office tells you, you are uh, uh, cheating and, and doing things wrong, you have a, a huge problem. And, and a lot of people got into deep trouble because of that. And that was partly because they used software that they actually didn't really understand so um and that is a reason of the possible negative impact now i am an optimistic guy so i would like to put another example uh, next to it uh, uh, colleagues of mine are very much uh, um, investigating all the possibilities and especially deep fakes and a lot of people think with deep fakes about that it's a bad thing but one very nice thing of deep fakes is you can use them in psychotherapy and generate situations for people that have some kind of of trauma and then uh bring them back to that situation and help them get over it and and actually the deep fake technology is very helpful for that so it it br brings both uh, uh, possibilities for the wrong and for the better. So, and it's up to, uh, amongst others, uh, uh, us guys to help people uh, select the good things and uh, make the best out of it. Rob, I've got 200 questions going through my head, but I'll first <laughs> hand over <laughs> to you if there's anything you okay. want to ask or say. Okay, this is this is getting so interesting. Um, so I'm going to go to a basic question. For the newbie in AI and, and quality, where do you suggest one starts? Yeah, where do you start? Well, just start reading stuff and start reading stuff that you're interested in because there are lots and lots of books and articles and there are blogs and vlogs and YouTube videos and whatever. And... Uh, the trouble is that um, not all of them are easy to access. So what I did over the years is just start with the things I found interesting and easy to access and then learn more about it. And also what can help a lot is join a special interest group. Join a group of people who like to discuss these things. I, I briefly looked at the attendee list and I saw some people from the special interest group that I am involved with. In, in the Netherlands, we have an association called TestNet, which is the Association of Software Testers. And within that, we have a working group around AI and uh, testing. And um, the discussions we have there bring a lot of new ideas and visions. And also, then you can help each other pointing out to ha have a look at this video, read this article, and also share knowledge and, and ideas. And uh, one of the things we did in that working group is uh, survey the AI-based testing tools. And 
when we started uh, writing the book, uh, we just mentioned some five years ago, there actually were no AI-based testing tools. Today, there are so many that I lost count. Uh, it's it really yeah. dozens and dozens of which some only have AI on the box and nowhere else, but mm -hmm. some others really use cool AI technology, although often it is still basically image recognition because these are the AI tools that help you test the uh, uh, user interface, which is fine, but some people think that that is the only testing needed to be done, and that's definitely not true. So, ah, your answer was, uh, where do you start? Well, yeah, just start looking. There's way more material than you can ever read and watch uh, because so many people do great things uh, with AI. Oh, that's great. Tony, I think you might have a question um, for Rick. Mm, I do. Thank you so much. And really, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I'm going to ask you a very controversial question, Rick, so prepare yourself. <laughs> um, nothing, nothing worse than being blindsided. But as an institute, we obviously are very concerned about um, skills and professionalism and, and particularly in South Africa, employment. There's a lot of unemployment. And the question I want to ask, in fact, all of you gentlemen, is, is the life of the software tester at risk from AI? You know, you've spoken about all these AI tools and so on. So, I mean, I know it's a very controversial question, but is, is life going to change? Is the role going to end? Is it going to be different? And then I'd like to ask a follow-up question after that. Well, that's um, a good question. You want to start, Rick? Very yeah, good. of course I want to start. And <laughs> I'll start with showing one of the two slides that I brought. And uh, I didn't know if I wanted to use them, but I'll use this one. So... This is generally about test execution. So you have a test object. First, you do some pre-test to see whether you want to do testing at all. And then you do your test execution. And then you have the investigating and assessment of the outcome. Now, my general statement is if we use automation, and it may be uh, general uh, traditional automation, it may be AI-based automation, the last task of quality and testing people that will be automated, that is the investigate and assess outcome. Because that's the very creative part where you have to find out what's happening. And so although our job will be supported by tools, and I've seen that over the, the, the four decades that I'm in IT now, eh, that we get more and more tools to support our job, but still some things will remain that needs creativity and, and real thinking power of people. And then people ask me, but yeah, what do you think about like 20 or 50 years? Of course, I have no clue. I, I dare to say that for the next 10 years, we still will have a job, although it will change, but we still will have a job. And beyond that, I have no clue because remember, uh, I always... Uh, take the parallel with smartphones. Do you realize that 15 years ago, smartphones simply did not exist? So if somebody 20 years ago would have made a prediction about today, they definitely would have forgotten to tell about smartphones. So I don't know what is going to be, but I surely know that creativity and, and uh, smart thinking still is needed. So... Mm -hmm. And probably, uh, Johan, I hope you would like to uh, respond to this. Yeah, Rick, I'm just, I'm like vibrating of all the things I want to say. But something that really changed my mind once um, is I was speaking to a, a doctor here locally who is a breast cancer researcher. Um, and But they use smart technology, so smart devices in the rural areas. They use machine um, learning algorithms for fast diagnosis and the like. And, and, and I love those conversations, people doing good with this technology. And um, one of the questions I asked her is, will AI replace doctors? And she said, AI will only replace doctors who don't use AI. And that really made me think, and I also almost want to bring it in here, one and firstly i agree fully with you this this technology will continually help us more and more but human interaction empathy creative thinking problem solving those face-to-face -face client conversations technology won't automate that 
But maybe one can also say it, that testers who are not familiar in using artificial intelligence technology might be replaced in the future. But the role of quality, as I said right at the beginning, given how this tech is impacting our lives, will increase. I think the role of quality engineers will, is most likely one of the more exciting careers in technology into the future. Before we go to the second question, I don't know, Rob, anything? Do you want to add? You can also tell us we are totally stupid and wrong. We are all, uh, it's a safe space. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think you summarized it quite well. Um, if I do a parallel to the just the transition from those early years where we used to do everything, test everything manually, and then a test automator came along and we started using tools, and then all those learnings of, you know, you, you, there's a difference between testing and test automation. And then as we've moved through the years and now we're using pipelines and we're doing all sorts of wonderful things with DevOps and all of the uh, continuous integration and continuous testing and all of those things and that skill. I mean, just recently I've learned a lot through on the ground interaction with software, the daily lives of software quality interactions and their generic uses of things like Git and Jenkins and all of these wonderful tools. If you're not doing that today, I think in a few years time, you, you're not going to be that marketable. Having said that, going back to the core things, you talk about the core things about creativity and that, yes, that's the root. And that, I think that's where the human, um, the human advantage over any technology will always be there. But at the same time, if, as my understanding of AI, the AI learning machine will grow and grow and those things will converge. So, so it will get closer. But I think if we don't embrace that as a software, a a software quality engineer or even a tester to embrace those things, because we need to do everything much faster, um, we need to use it for the right things. And if we if, if we discount those things, if we discount the tools, we discount the automation, we discount the technology, we're going to be redundant. So I think it's more about the mindset of how you approach, how you do your work and what you've got available to do rather than to say, this is my role in a box and that's how I'm going to continue for the rest of my life. Mm, fantastic. Just uh, quickly before we go to the next question, you'll see both uh, Rick and uh, Honey as, um, sorry, let me just make sure I've got the, pronunciation right here. Yeah. That is honey. Um, they've um, added links to um, the working group. So please click on that before we end this call later so that you still have it somewhere open uh, in your browser. And there's one question, Saba, that we'll get to, but I also want to encourage our delegates, please add comments and questions. And yeah, Tony, this one, this okay. question really um, made us think. That was good. So good. Can you hear the second one? Yeah, well, it's it's a follow-up, and I think all three of you have actually started touching on the response to it, but it's one that you know, just interests me. Before I do go there, Johan, just also please note I've marked a question from, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, Akiniran, um, and it says under Q&A only, because I, when I mark this question, it moves to to that tab. Um, thank you, guys. And I mean, I, you know, you can see bald and grey. I've been around a long time in IT. I started IT in the in the, in the sort of early to mid 80s. And I know there are a few on the chat that will sort of try and vie with me for how long we've been around, you know, but that's, that's <laughs> irrelevant. But certainly when I started in development, I mean, you know, we used to do all our testing ourselves. So, so the, the role of the dedicated software tester, quality assurance analyst and so on came evolutionarily or revolutionarily, I suppose evolutionarily somewhat later on. But my second question, and, and I know it's certainly Johan also touched on it, is you know, uh, Rob asked, where, where do you suggest a software tester starts, Rick, with AI? And, and my follow-up question is, do you suggest, and I think Johan answered it with the doctor question or the doctor um, anecdote, do you suggest that software testers actually get involved with AI? And if so, you know, what, what are the key things? So it's not just about where they start, but in terms of their development, you know, self-development, what should they be looking for? What are the key uh, um, takeaways that they can perhaps take from today? Thanks. Um, ah, that's a long question with a lot of different things. Um, what, what I would like to start with a remark on a uh, long time ago in IT when we didn't have separate testers. Um, I also remember that back then 
IT systems were not as complex as they are today. So it was easier to test a whole system. Eh? Back then we, we had the illusion that we tested everything. Today we know we can't. And especially when you work with multiple teams on parts of an IT system, but the overall end-to-end -end process also needs to be tested. That's somewhere where I still think even in a DevOps world, you will need separate dedicated testing teams for to do that end-to-end -end testing it. Um, so that's where you see some separation. On the other hand, I think all IT people should know something about quality engineering and testing and uh, should know uh, what kind of tools to use. And testing tools may be very simple, like the, the most used ex uh, uh, testing tool today op probably still is uh, Microsoft Excel. Yeah. But um, more and more other tools also are used and Often people only think of test execution tools, but there are many more tools that you can use. For example, tools to create test cases, like let's say pairwise testing tools that drastically uh, reduce the number of combinations you need to test. Um, and uh, to be able to use tools, you need to know a little bit uh, of the background of these tools. And that's what I see with AI-based tools, huh? uh, some of the uh, companies that put AI-based testing tools in the market, they claim that you don't need anything else anymore. But I, for example, know a tool that is great in trying every link that is on your website. And of course, such a tool is much better than doing that manually yeah? because clicking every link and seeing whether it crashes or not is a very boring task and a machine can do that much better. But it becomes more difficult if you don't only want to know if the, uh, the uh, application crashes, but also if you want to know if when you click there and it gets to the next screen, if that is the expected next screen. And well, an AI by itself cannot always determine whether the outcome is the thing they uh, you really expect it. So, um, like, and, and we all already touched upon it before, uh, it is getting more and better tools to make your work more efficient, um, better, but still tools remain tools. They may be very smart tools, but still it's a tool to support you in doing your job. And um, some parts of the job may be fully automated, but most times it is to support you in doing your work. Amazing, Eric. I want to get to some of the questions and then I also have a few. You know, I've, <laughs> if you look at my desk, the amount of sticky notes, I definitely don't work in a digital manner because I find if I don't see it, I don't remember it. Um, so, so let's get to Saba's question because that was, you've, Eric mentioned something very interesting about deep fakes being used in therapy. I often think, because I mean, there, there's already websites where you can, you speak, it records your voice or it looks at your face and you can say, I want to uh, change me to Barack Obama, for instance. And the, it's so accurate. I often wonder in a court of law, if the evidence presented is a so-called voice note or a video, how do what will happen to the to the courts? How do they determine? Yeah, I've even there's a little website where I can send myself a WhatsApp using your profile picture from your WhatsApp with your mobile, so it'll say MTN or Vodafone or whatever. So now I've got proof, a screenshot that you've sent me a WhatsApp with whatever you've said there. But so I think the deep fake thing will become a big thing. But I mean this thing about therapy and, and trauma where and Saba says, are there instances at the moment? I think you did refer to that, Rick, but maybe just a little bit more about that, uh, if you don't mind. Um, well, the um, you mentioned our podcast. We did a podcast, but I think it was the Dutch version with uh, Thijs Pepping, who is one of the researchers who has looked into this. Um, so probably uh, some of you uh, in South Africa can understand our Dutch podcast and then definitely have a look. Um, 
also Thijs Pepping is one of the authors of a book and I'll, uh, uh, which is called Real Fake. And Real Fake recently uh, appeared. I'll, I'll put the name in the, in the chat while you just Google for the book Real Fake. And that gives a lot of examples of how uh, it is used uh, today in both for the better and for the worse. And they also talk about these dilemmas. Uh, one, one of the big things with AI is the dilemma of ethics. Are the things that you do, are they right things to do? Eh? Because with AI, a lot of things can be done and AI itself doesn't know whether it's good or bad what it's doing. So uh, we as IT people need to be aware of that. Also, a whole new uh, yeah, area uh, of, of uh, expertise is starting. And that is what you might call uh, so-called digital detectives who try to figure out if things were real or not. Because you were referencing to a court of law. Well, it has been for centuries that people have tried to fool judges. Only today we have much more sophisticated tools to try to fool them. And probably the judge uh, themselves can't distinguish between a real WhatsApp and a fake WhatsApp. But luckily we have people who are able to get the signs whether it must be real or isn't real. And I recently read an article about this kind of uh, research where one of the things they do is simply get a lot of different pieces of data and correlate them. For example, if a WhatsApp has been sent at a certain moment, um, but from other data, it looks like the person who sent it wasn't active because it was in the middle of the night and they were asleep, then ha you have some other uh, supporting evidence that probably it's a fake, um, uh, a fake message. And that's what's happening. And that's also, again, something where AI is helping because you'll get a lot of different data and you uh, research the patterns in that data to see whether it's likely or not. The only trouble for the judge is judges themselves also should look into this technology because they need to understand a bit about the background. And it becomes more and more a thing of um, yeah, statistics and, and confidence eh? because uh, these scientists never will say it's 100% sure that it is this. But they will say there's a 97% chance for this and a 28% chance for that. And, and then as a judge, you must make the final judgment. Interesting. I want to, before we get to more questions, Rob, uh, any comments or questions from your side? It's a uh, fascinating this, this conversation, is a, I think. It's a very fascinating conversation. I, I was thinking that, that now not only the, the judges need to do this, the prosecutors and the defense lawyers also need to up their game with all of this stuff. Mm. So I, I think it's not just in our specific niches in our lives. It, it's, in, it's across the board that we're going to be changing our game. Okay, I've got another question here. Um, and this is probably uh, quite an interesting one. Um, I would think that in the world of usability and UX, user experience, and all of those kind of things, we it, we would be leveraging off AI technology even more, I suppose, across the board. But but what are your thoughts on that specific channel or that specific area of testing, Rick? Um, sorry, I missed. What specific area of testing do you mean, then? Like usability. So usability oh, is, okay. a, is a whole niche and these wow. days usability and user experience is so important because for example like with mobile apps the minute the minute the user's got a problem he just deletes the app and that's that's the app gone so it's it's becoming a, a very important uh aspect and and traditionally it, it can take time people in the old days used to set up usability labs and all of those kind of things uh to get this done but I'm sure there's tools in today's world that help you get this done more effectively. 
Yeah. Well, um, I, I just quickly put on the other slide that I prepared, which has the so-called quality characteristics. And usability is one of them and is an important one. Um, and the interesting thing with AI is uh, that uh, I'm, I, I don't think it's good that I explain all the uh, quality characteristics here, but you can read for yourself. But what you see on the right is that uh, in our book, we uh, found a few extra quality characteristics that were needed if you test modern things. And the, the question of uh, uh, Rob about usability triggered me because uh, usability looks at how does the end user interact with the system, but for the end user to really use the system well, the system itself also needs some characteristics. For example, that, and what we added were intelligent behavior, morality and uh, personality. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know about the viewers, but I, I just can't read the bottom line because our pictures are in front of it. Um, but uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but the idea here. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, these are characteristics that you don't have for traditional IT systems, what you do have with uh, um, uh, AI systems. Take, for example, a chatbot. If you want to have a good conversation with the chatbot, one thing that's important is intelligent behavior. The, the chatbot really should have some level of intelligence and actually answering questions that you have and not just saying all the time, uh, I don't understand your keyword or something like that, which I have seen happening. Um, also, personality is important because suppose your audience are high school kids, then your chatbots should work differently than when your uh, audience are uh, senior citizens, then because you want to approach them differently. Um, and the one in, in the middle is uh, morality. And morality is, for example, about ethics. Uh, are we doing things that we should do? Uh, because with AI, you can do a lot of things that maybe you shouldn't. And one of the examples I found very interesting, and I'll, uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll put the name in the chat, but there is a woman called Joy Buau Lamwini from the US, and she is a, 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 a colored lady, and she did investigate face recognition. And then she noticed that her face wasn't recognized because the face recognition uh, algorithms that are standard used have been trained on uh, uh, light colored people and not on dark colored people. And then so it simply didn't work. And that was a nice example of yeah, the morality kind and that you should think about how, what is this actually used for? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question completely, but probably you have follow-on questions. Yeah. Rick, there's, you've just touched on something which I also think will take us to Coley's question, but we'll take uh, Akini Ran's question first. But what I wanted to say is, so this whole idea of biases, which we did, that's the problem with facial recognition. Female faces, darker skinned faces, it struggles with it. A lot of your big tech firms has, have rolled back on their technology. It's not as effective in policing and stuff. But I almost, um, but we can get to it later, but can you, and I'm sure you can, but can you test for biases? in the code. Because I mean, if a tester is a biases tester, that's a hugely important role, but I'll just pause there. Let me get to this question. Uh, what is the place of semantic, the semantic web with AI testing? And I, obviously the semantic web is the World Wide Web 3. I personally don't know all that much about it. So what is the place of semantic, the semantic web with AI testing? Any thoughts on that, uh, Rick? Um, 
Well, I'm sorry. I've, ne I've never I've thought of that. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to write that down. It's worth investigating, but it's a great question. Sorry, we don't have an answer. Um, <laughs> getting to Coley's one, uh, I have a question. I think this is the reason why some people are skeptical in adopting AI. Is AI going to evolve and rule the world and oppress humans? Coley, you are expressing what a lot of people across the world are wondering about and are thinking a hugely um, important question. Um, I'm going to start with you, Rob. Do you think the bots are going to take over? <laughs> I don't know if anyone really knows, but your thoughts before I get to Rick. I'll default. I'll default to it depends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it depends how many how many science fiction movies you take in, and what what we saw twenty years ago. Let let's let's look at the fact that twenty years ago, or even fifteen years ago, we were talking about video calling, and we said, "Wow, that could be amazing," and now it's a daily thing. So. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Oh. But I think, Rick, Rick, you alluded to it earlier that technology is neutral. It's not good or bad. It's what we do with it. Um, and we still have time, I think, in the next five or ten years to steer this technology in the right way. But but for you to answer Coley's question, will it evolve to oppress us as humans? Your thoughts on that? Well, I have had quite a number of discussions on that topic uh, already. And... My personal take on this is the following. So we distinguish three levels of AI. We distinguish narrow artificial intelligence, which is good at doing one thing. For example, an autonomous car, it can drive itself. It's very good at car driving. But if you ask it to uh, vacuum clean your house, it can't. Eh? And if you have a robot vacuum cleaner, well, that one can't answer the phone, etc. So that's narrow AI. It can do one thing. It can do it better than people can, but uh, not all. Then we have the concept of general AI, which is AI at the same level as people. So it's just as smart as we are. And that's the thing you often see in uh, uh, films where they have a robot and uh, uh, um uh, a good film uh, in with that respect is uh, uh, Ex Machina uh, about a, uh, a robot that well is actually becoming smarter than people, and then we get to super intelligence, uh, artificial super intelligence, and then my first statement is not for the next ten years. So mm -hmm. I don't know beyond that because, like I said, uh, it's very difficult to see what's going to happen, but. If we get artificial super intelligence and it becomes smarter than people, then there is roughly three possibilities. There's the possibility that it will uh, treat us like we treat ants. Uh, you know, uh, ants, uh, when, when we get uh, uh, disturbed by them, we just crush them and then we don't uh, bother about them. But generally, we don't think about ants. Uh, so then it's in a totally separate world. Or they may treat us like pets. Eh? Take, for example, a cat. If you have a cat around your house, they, they live like a king. Eh? They get food and, and uh, exercise and all the things for free, and they never do a, a simple thing. So to some people, that sounds very appealing. Um, but also, it may be just that we get... AI that is very good at specific things and supports our life in that. And then, like you say, uh, uh, it, uh, the technology itself isn't good or bad. It's just what people do with it. So it's also how do we train it? And therefore, it is important that IT people keep an eye on uh, what should and what should we not uh, we do with it and, and how do we train it and what kind of moral compass do we give to this AI? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's not too late yet to influence AI in the direction that it won't just eliminate us all. Okay. Rick, so that brings us to uh, Elizabeth's great question. I want to ask you something. We've got five minutes left, and I'm going to be very unfair and ask that you answer this question in one minute, <laughs> and then we'll get to Elizabeth. It seems that robotic process automation, which is your typical 
uh, back office administrative kind of tasks, which can be automated. I hear more and more about RPA playing a role in test or test automation. So in one minute, your thoughts and comments on that before I get to Elizabeth's question. Well, in my opinion, it is the other way around. Um, RPA uses tools that previously were used for testing because test tools, they can input stuff on a screen and then you can use it uh, to automatically uh, do input and RPA does that on a live system uh, with live data. So actually it is testing becoming common uh, technology. And also my prediction is that RPA will not be needed in the future when we get good IT systems because RPA is mostly used to interface systems that don't have a proper API. Okay. Good question. Answer. I'm going to give you the last one and then I will, and also we've got three minutes for this one, Rick, and then maybe Rob some final comments and then Tony, if we, we can close it off and I see more questions coming in. I mean, this could, we could do a day seminar on this topic at least. Elizabeth asks a question that's close to my own heart. Do you think that governments need to start taking notice of AI with regard to introducing new laws around AI. Now, in South Africa, even though we had the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution more than a year ago, we do have a privacy regulation, but we don't really have much from a regulatory point of view when it comes to AI, responsible AI. So in two minutes, <laughs> Rick, governments and AI, what's your view on that? Governance certainly must pay attention to that and and uh the the interesting thing is i told you that the previous government in the netherlands fell over partly because of ai but the good thing of the new government is we now have a minister who is responsible for digitization and one of the parts i i read the part in the uh, agreement of the new government is about uh, the use of uh, new digital tools, which includes AI. So governments are becoming aware of it. If they will be good at it is still my doubt because it's very difficult to, to regulate this eh? because how do you make laws to enforce things like this? So mm -hmm. it's, it's challenging, but the good thing is they start understanding that something must be done. Rick, before I hand over to, to Rob for one minute and then to Tony, from my side, this was such a great conversation. Uh, we always have great conversations. I thank you for getting up so early and for You're joining welcome. us and look forward to the next books. And uh, again, to the <laughs> delegates, really want to encourage you to, to read um, Rick's books. It's really fascinating. So again, Tony, um, Rob, everyone. So that's it from me, Rob. Any last thoughts? And then uh, to Tony. Okay, last thoughts from me. I think we should have a part two. Uh, this was a, a, a enthralling mm. conversation, and the the questions are coming through thick and fast. I don't know if we can save them somewhere for for the next round, if possible. Rick, are you up to another one? <laughs> Putting you on the spot there. I'd, thank you so much for for coming through and for this conversation. Thank you, Johan, for pushing it through, and uh, Tony for pulling all these things together, and for for everybody out there from all over the world my Australian friends um, and a bunch of other people, all good. It's fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Tony? <clears throat> Thanks, gents. And, and maybe, Rick, just if there's any last thing you'd like to say before I close off. Well, thanks, everybody. And keep looking into AI because it's definitely going to change our lives. And I'll do what I can to make that a change for the better. Thank you. Thanks also to Honey from Kutin, who's uh, given us a link to a PDF document. Uh, I'll just glance at it quickly. Looks awesome. So I'll be reading that with interest uh, sometime after. To you three gentlemen, particularly to Rick from the Netherlands, thank you so much. But of course, to my two colleagues here in South Africa as well, Rob and Johan, it's been absolutely awesome. Um, you know, this is not my area of greatest expertise, but I've been fascinated and 100 questions have come into my head as well. So thank you to all three of you. I think a part two is an absolute must, Jen, so we'll schedule it for a little bit later in the year, perhaps. To our delegates, there have been a lot of really good and challenging questions. And again, with uh, 
uh, Rob commenting, you know, from Greece, from Elizabeth and Dennis in Greece, Elizabeth in Australia, Stefano in the UK, Rick in the, in the, and Honey in the Netherlands. I assume Honey's in the Netherlands. Um, a gentleman from India whose name escapes me right now and so on. Thank you all for joining from Zimbabwe. It's been a real international webinar. Uh, we as IITPSA want to thank you all for your attendance. Thank you to our three speakers. We wish you a safe and productive day further. And we look forward to joining you on the next IRTPSA webinar in the near future. Take care all and have a great day. <laughs> the cat. I love it. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Cheers. Bye, Rick. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. Cheers, Cheers all. <laughs>